Hello and welcome everyone for another webinar on people management in partnership with uh, between MAMG Advogados and Arbitration Channel. Today we have a very special guest for our interview, uh, Noyana Marigo. Welcome, Noyana. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. I will briefly int introduce you to the audience. Uh, Noyana is the uh, global co-head of Fresh Foods International Arbitration Group and the co-head of the firm's Latin American practice. She has an LM in international law uh, from New York University, an MBL, international business and taxation law from University of Paris, one, a JD from University of Buenos Aires. She's currently the co-chair of the IBA Investment Arbitration Committee and also uh, a member of the Academic Council of the Arbitration Channel. So thank you again, uh, Noyana. It's great to have you here with us. Carolina and I will have the pleasure to interview you. And since we have a short time here to discuss so many questions with you, you know, discussing leadership in these challenging times, we're going to start with the questions. As we discussed, we're going to start with uh, some broader questions, uh, some general context on where we are, where we currently stand, and then we go uh, from there into more specific topics. So the first question, uh, how do you see the role of leaders nowadays in international uh, firms? And what are some of the major challenges facing those leaders? Thank I think you. you're muted, yeah. Thank you, Rafael, and thank you, Carolina, and thank you for this invitation. I think discussing uh, people's management issues is really important and even more today, and we'll, we'll get to that, but it's really a pleasure to be here. I guess when we're talking about leadership, you can, it depends on the law firm and it depends on the leader. It's very difficult to generalize, but I will just at least give you an idea of how I try to picture myself when I start thinking about leadership and, and, and the challenges that we have in an international law firm. So for me, when we start thinking about what do we do here is our ultimate goal is to provide the best legal advice that we can to our clients and in an efficient way. Why do we do that? Is because that will bring you the best clients, that will bring you the best work, and that's what you need to attract your talent, either the best partners that you can have in the market or the best associates that you have in the market. And you have to do it efficiently because you have to be profitable. And that will allow you also to pay uh, enough to be competitive and bring the talent together. And I would say that that was very clear um, a couple of years ago, but today that's far from being enough. And the new challenge that we have is that in addition to giving people the best work, the best clients, um, the best conditions to work, and in terms of benefits and payments, you also have to take care of their well-being. And this is a must today. And where, where I say that it's a challenge for leadership is first, because it's quite new. I think now we are really realizing that that has to be top of our list. And second, because it's not as easy when you're deciding salaries, you just decide how much and you pay by categories. It's pretty easy to establish a rule and apply it across the board. When we are talking about well-being, basically it depends on each individual and it might even change with time. You can be a young associate that wants to have uh, I don't know, work that is more interesting because wants to put all his, his energy or her energy in, in the career. You might have someone who has family and have other interests. People might have a period of time what needs to take care of elderly parents or uh, needs a break because of uh, some, some other health issues. So the only way to deal with that is really communicating with people and getting to know exactly what their needs are, needs are and adapting a as you go along. And this requires a lot of time and a lot of investment for leadership. In a time where leaders are also uh, competing for time and uh, trying to get much more done today with, I think with email, with the speed of the information, it, it, it actually, our lives are, are, are pretty, pretty busy 
So that's the major challenge of, because there's no way around. We will have we have to take care of the well-being of people to in order to be, be able to recruit them and to retain them. And if we don't do that, you we will never be able to be a successful law firm because you cannot provide the best service that you want. So the only thing I have to figure out is how how we do it. Great, thank you, Nayana. Um, so regarding the pandemic. Um, so the pandemic has been a watershed event uh, in so many ways and across so many industries. Uh, we are still understanding um, the magnitude of some changes that we are facing and to what extent they are here to stay. Regarding law firms in particular, uh, how do you think the pandemic has affected the daily life of lawyers and what does it mean to be a leader in this context of the pandemic? Yeah, I think that the impact that it had in, in all of us was um, tremendous. And also we cannot, we should not forget now that we're kind of going back to normal because I think that some of the effects that uh, we we saw in the, during the pandemic are here to stay. We still don't know exactly in what shape or form, but they, they have transformed uh, our personalities and the way we see things. So I will start by the obvious thing. So the remote working, uh, first of all, demonstrated that uh, you to be a good lawyer and to be a successful lawyer, you didn't need to spend all your time in the office. You could be as successful and as a good lawyer being at home or working from a different location or working on hours that are a little bit more uh, odd than the office hours. So I think that this was a, a good uh, discovery for all of us. I think some practices like international arbitration because we were used to Travel a lot, working remotely was kind of uh, an unknown thing, but other practice areas, as I talked to other people, it was like, you need to be in the office, you need to be around the corner, you need to come for all of the meetings. Um, that I think is gone, and I don't think we're gonna have it back of at, the, at least 100%. Um, it had a negative connotation as well, that is it put a lot of pressure on people because, um, you were with your families. I think we all for a while became aware that we were in danger. And that was, I think, very touching for many people. Many people lost family members. Um, some more junior associates were, were uh, living alone in small spaces. That was very, very difficult when you were isolated for, for such a long time. And we blurred the lines between family or, or or personal life and work life, because suddenly you were at home, you were connected all the time, you had you could go and, and, and cook and then come back to your office. So that had the flexibility part, which was good for many people. But at the same time, I think we lost a little bit control of what is our own time and home time and what is work um, time. So now we have to take all that and try to see, okay, how do we take the good elements of all this and make it work in the future because there are a lot of things that that are good. The second element I think was people starting really focusing on um, work-life balance. Maybe because at the beginning was this completely loss of control and you were working all day long and you were struggling with IT and then uh, you didn't have anything else to do so you were on your computer all day and I think that had a big impact on people's well-being and started saying no. Now for me, it's really important to take time. And I need that the law firm starts taking care of that when I go back after the pandemic. Um, clearly, we have more flexibility. And that was, has been, for me, very, very useful. Like, even in things like hearings, we now can say when a hearing is not a, that you don't have many witnesses, you don't have many experts, I'm saying, you know what, we can have these, uh, online and, and we don't need to travel, we don't need to add more glo more to global warming. Um, and I would say the, the last thing, I'm, I'm, I'm very silly, I think we even started being less formal. I don't know if that's all around the world, but as a lawyer, we were always very formal, very with suits. And now I think I haven't seen anyone wearing a suit for a long time, which probably is a good thing. Nayana, you mentioned uh, several important topics uh, in your answers before, such as you know the well-being, you know caring about the well-being of associates, work-life balance, flexibility. 
let's discuss this in the context of you know leadership. So well-being well in particular has been one of the most uh, debatable topics among both companies and law firms, especially considering the effects of the pandemic that we just we just discussed. And that pandemic, as you mentioned, severely, severely impact physical and mental health of all professionals across industries. So how has your firm been dealing with it? And how have you dealt with it regarding your team and, and Freshfield's arbitration practice? You, you mentioned before, and I think it's already a, a key insight from you in this interview, the importance of communicating with the team to understand where they stand and what are the needs. So how have you been dealing with this, uh, the topic of well-being in, in your practice nowadays? I think in my practice, or maybe for everyone, the first um, Eureka, Eureka moment was we have to relearn that the rules that we applied before are not working anymore, and probably we have no clue how to make them work. So how do we manage people when I don't see them every day or sometimes never? Um, how do I make sure that everyone, if they're not coming to the office, have the same opportunities? How do I make sure the juniors are trained? That is a problem that we start seeing with the flexibility is great, but if you're not in the office, you miss a lot of, of learning that just happens because you hear people, you go and you ask someone and you're not, not gonna do that if you have to call someone. Um, and for me, something that has always been very important for my team, and actually I think our keys, one of the keys of our success is the culture. We, we were a team that we were, we spent a lot of time together, um, we did a lot of socializing. We knew each other's um, families and uh, pets. And, and when you start not being in person that much, uh, you have to make an extra effort just to keep that culture together. And I worry. Uh, I think we are doing pretty much okay, but I, I worry that in the long term, we'll start missing some of the elements, particularly because new people start joining the team and hasn't, these, these new people haven't lived all of the experiences that made us be together and have the same culture. So what I started doing is think, basically thinking, I don't have the answer, thinking through all that and, and being aware that this is happening and trying to put in place some rules. For example, if, if I have people who are working from home and we have a, a Teams meeting or a, a meeting with a client online, just make sure the person who is at home, if there are other people in the office, take a, lead, a leadership re, uh, role in the call so that the client doesn't perceive that person as not being as integrated as uh, the rest of the team that might be together. Um, I try to make sure, okay, if people are, some people are coming more to the office than others, uh, from time to time, are we giving them exactly the same opportunities or just people might be picking work just because they are close by. So what, what requires from, from me at least, and I think it's just to be aware all the time uh, and actively thinking. And the rest is sit down with the people and just really try to understand what they need in terms of well-being because it's, it's, it's different for, for everyone. So you might have an idea also in your head of what they need and you might be completely mistaken because you come from your own perspective, which is very different, particularly when you have different ages and different stages in life in, in, your, in your team. I think also that what you have to be now is more supportive, communicate more and more empathetic. Uh, that, that's, I think, the new, the new trend. Um, in terms of policies at Freshfields for the last couple of years, diversity and well-being has, have been at the top of our priorities and it's the area where we have been investing more efforts and, and resources. And in particular regarding mental health, because we realized that with the pandemic, uh, I don't know whether we started seeing more cases or people are starting speaking up more. Probably that I, I would say that is the second, which is a good thing because people would not would not have a problem to say, oh, I'm sick, I need to be home because I have a flu, but they will never tell you they're not feeling well because I don't know, they, they lost a, a loved one and they need time to regroup and, and be sad. Um, so I think one of the positive things is people are feeling more entitled to just speak up and, and, and ask for help. 
Uh, one of the programs that we put in place and, and has worked very well is we created a um, global mental health support team that basically with the help of consultants, we trained, I think we have now over 300 people that have been trained to basically have the skills to recognize mental health problems, so keep, provide support and guidance to these people and um, make sure they get the, the right support and the right help. Uh, at the same time, because we talk about that so much, people are starting to have their own skills to try to manage their mental health better and to get and get help whenever they need. We also have a mental health affinity group, which again is a group of people that are interested in this topic for different reasons, but maybe because they suffer some problems or because they are interesting, interested in helping other people. And they just make sure we are constantly talking about this and we're taking the right initiatives and they feed upwards to the leadership and that weren't to, to the teams. Uh, and then we try to keep the conversation going. So from time to time we show, okay, we'll do the mental health day and we say we're gonna take two days off as Freshfields mental health days, or we'll try to give opportunities to people to go and, and do community work because that sometimes gives you some reward that is different from being in the office and working for clients as 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 good as you could be working for clients sometimes you need something something else um but i think it, it's a challenge um you need a lot of communication as 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 i was saying the second thing that you need is a lot of people being proactive not only leadership but people should take ownership of their well-being and say, this is what I need and speak up because people cannot always assume that uh, what they are providing is the right thing. And then we need a lot of solidarity. And I, I try to emphasize this when, when, when I speak to, to my team, it's for everyone to enjoy a, a much better work-life balance or well-being, we also have, we all have to help. So today I might need a day off because I don't have childcare and someone else will cover. And the next day, someone else will have to go on vacation and we're gonna make sure that person is covered so that we don't. So we need to really work with a team and we have to be all responsible for making our lives better. It cannot be a question of this is what I did and this is my, my space because that's not gonna work. We all have to work together and, and, and be, be in a way very, very generous with each other. And maybe a sense of community and you know in collaboration a more collaborative culture in that regard meaning more solidarity could mean also more collaboration uh between the team members as a follow-up question uh Noyana, you know there used to be some glamour in our industry in our practice in those all-nighters as you may recall and even uh, uh working long hours on a regular basis um, working uh, during the weekends on a regular basis, even all-nighters on a regular basis. Uh, what's your take on this? Are we, are we still in that uh, stage in our industry of you know tr treating those uh, type of uh, work as you know some kind of a glamour of doing like an all-nighter or, or are we going somewhere else, hopefully, right now? I'm, I'm going to be very blunt here. I hate all-nighters. I've held, I've hated them all my life when I was, and particularly when I was a junior associate, I had nothing to say or do other than staying up all night. No, what, what I hated and what I still think is the wrong approach for many, many years, staying up all night, uh, bragging about how many nights I could be away without even going home for a shower and I can sleep on a box in my office and uh, I could work, I don't know how many days with a stop, was seen as a batch of uh, of a skill or something that had to be valued. And I think for me it was always completely the wrong approach because one, for me always meant you are not even able to organize yourself so that you can get to a deadline without having to survive without sleeping or eating for days. Second is very risky as a professional because as clever and as long endurance that we have, uh, your brain cannot function the same way if you have slept, even if it's a couple of hours. Um, and then I thought it was very 
prejudicial or negative for certain group of people because if you had a family at the time, of course, do all those nighters either would have ruined your personal life or you wouldn't be able to do your job. So I thought it was really an unhealthy culture. I would like to think that those days are behind. I cannot say it for sure. I think most of the partners of my generation with whom I talk to, I think we are all in line and that's going to only improve because the new generation of associates now, they are like, they hate all this. So I think we, we can be hopeful that if there's still some, some of these somewhere there, uh, it's going to disappear. And it doesn't mean that we will never work uh, at night or late or, or, or a weekend if you have to. Uh, what I, I think is the value has to be has to be avoided. And if you do it, you at least try to anticipate that you're doing it because I don't know, if you have a hearing and you have the night, the last night you have to stay up because you have a closing. Okay, there's nothing that you can do. You only have a night to do a closing, you do it. But if you think proactively, you try to accommodate people's needs or even in periods where you work really hard. So some, some of the things that I tend to do is when we have a hearing, which for me is the most challenging in, in, in that regard, because it's only a week and there's not much room for, for error. So you need everyone, uh, all hands on deck. But at least you say, okay, maybe juniors stay later at night, the people who are going to the hearing go to sleep earlier and then come in early in the morning. Just again, for me, you communicate, you organize ahead of time, and you make sure everyone has a, at least a fair share of of, of rest. Um, same with the weekends. There are weekends where you might have to work anyhow, but try to make it an exception and try to make it in a way that if you're going to ask someone to work over the weekend, they can feel comfortable saying, is there anyone that can cover because I don't have childcare this weekend or this weekend I don't know. Or you tell them in advance, OK, we're going to have a filing in a month. Please make sure there is a high rate that we will have to work over the weekend. So at least people have a little bit more control. I think what is horrible is when you feel that you don't have control and you have to just improvise at the very last minute. And if, if you allow me one additional question before Carolina jumps in, uh, just by communicating with the team and listening to their needs, is already a huge improvement, I would say, in how we manage, you know, how we deal with time management within the team. So what you're saying is already, I would say, speaks a lot in terms of, you know, and maybe a new paradigm that we are building in our industry, hopefully. Carolina, you have an, a, an additional subject, right? But I also just wanted to make a comment uh, on what Mariana was saying. Um, I think also what's changing is the sense of urgency that usually the teams have, right? I mean, it's not only being proactive and understanding what you need to do in advance, but also understanding whether you really have to do it during your Saturday or if that can wait until Monday. I think that's also yeah. changing. Hopefully. Yeah, and on that, I think good news, at least I, I've had lately very good experiences with clients because in the past, as a partner, you would have the client telling you, okay, it's Friday afternoon, I want it for Monday. So there's no way out. Um, you could try to push back, but we know that with the clients, we're always respectful. With some clients, you can do it. With some others, you cannot. Uh, but what I've been seeing more and more from my clients now is say, okay, I'm asking this, please don't do it over the weekend. We, I don't need it. Uh, do it on Tuesday or, or Wednesday. Or if something comes up on the weekend, they apologize 15 times while they send it and when they receive it. And they just make sure, OK, do something quick. I don't need to spend the whole weekend on this. Um, so there is a conversation now going on. And clients also value that you value well-being and work by balance in your team. So that's positive. It's, it's, it's a conversation that I'm seeing now coming from the clients. Yeah, we have been seeing that in Brazil too. Some, some clients that um, actually wrote some sort of letter, open letter saying that they didn't want their, um, their lawyers to be working during the weekend or long hours and that they wouldn't accept uh, even receiving emails after a certain um, 
time of the night. Um, so moving on, um, Nayana, I would like to know um, uh, how do you think the administrative staff uh, should deal with uh, well-being and how should they help leaders and what's the, the role of leaders and of the staff um, and in comparison? I think, and, and I'll, when, when I was preparing for this interview, I decided, okay, most of these questions or some of these questions I, I should ask my team. So I did a, a little monkey survey with uh, my people. So I, I have some, some things that I, might be interesting to, to discuss later, but um, I, was, I, I asked these questions. What, what do you think the leaders um, have to do and the partners and the staff, what's the role of each of them? And I think one comment was very, very interesting. And they say that it, it has to be a, a full circle, right? I think sometimes they feel that the staff and we have all these programs, we have all these trainings, all of the communication coming from the firm or from the staff. But then if that's not applied by all of the partners, and if the staff doesn't come in at the end of it, just to make sure if partners are not applying it, there are consequences or there is follow up or um, it doesn't work. So I think we have to be it's not more than being consistent, right? So if there is a decision that is being made by the firm of how we have to behave with people, then everyone, the staff and the partner, have to work together to make sure that we are delivering a cons cons consistent message and we are, we are following through. Um, we, we have a, a big team of staff that are that is working on, on diversity and well-being and mental health issues, and we get a lot of support. Um, I have to recognize as well that partners, I would say being a partner is one of the most difficult work jobs that you can have because you have to be good at the law and that okay you went to university for that so that's your what you, what you know how to do and then you become a partner and then okay but now you have to sell your practice you probably never did marketing but you still have to do marketing to the best of your abilities and then you have to manage people but you never study human resources so you do it at the best of your abilities and now it's not only managing people in a normal way to have to have into account all these issues that are very delicate in terms of diversity, in terms of uh, mental health issues, well-being. So we need the support of the staff to educate us and to tell us exactly how to do these things because we we might we might have the best intentions, but uh, we're not experts. We, we most of the time I think we are trying our best, but I'm not sure we're the most qualified people to be doing these things. But you have to. And do you think um, the leaders understand usually the importance um, of their role in managing teams and leading with people and guaranteeing their well-being? Because as you mentioned, it's something new sometimes when you become a partner. But then do you think they have the sense usually? I think it varies. Um, and I think it um, should be the more and more one of the qualities that we require when people are going to be made up as partners. And I think there's a lot of work to do there. It's just what do we, what's the message? What we are requiring our senior associates that are going to become the new partners to be? Are we asking them only to be a good associate doing their own work on their desk? No. I think one of the elements that you have to say to become a partner, what you have to do is train your, train your team. And training your team means also managing your team, making sure there is well-being in your team. So you cannot become a partner in one day and have all these in place. So I think it's very important that from very early on, we start already training our associates to develop all these skills. Certainly. And uh, you mentioned before um, that your firm is very interested in also promoting uh, diversity and inclusion. Do you think there is a relationship between um, flexibility in the workplace, for example, and um, well-being and diversity and inclusion? Yeah, certainly. I, I think that having more flexibility certainly gives you more space to have more diverse people or get people of color and women and, and other minorities just feel more at home. And there are some some statistics out there or some, some uh, research that says that in 2021, when 
uh, you review what uh, people of color and women say about how they feel in the workplace, uh, and that this is not only lawyers, but in general, uh, they feel much more welcoming, they feel much more part of the family, they, they feel less isolated. And I think everyone working from home, not, not having to be um, all the time in the office, that helps. It just, in a way, makes it more ne neutral. Uh, but we have to be very careful with that uh, because it can also have a, a negative effect, particularly in the long term, because the bias that we have and that have been a problem for fostering diversity can also be applied now in a way that if you are not in the office and you are a minority, you get more isolated. And we, we take less act, active measures for you to be integrated. So all that to say, I think it helps. It can help, but we have to be very, very careful and monitoring very, very carefully that with the new flex, flex policies, we, we are not leaving anyone, anyone behind who might not have the same opportunities than, than the majority. Before we change subject, Noyana, to discuss you know, the financial aspects of this, this conversation, just a, a quick uh, uh, follow-up question to you, because as you, as you mentioned before, answering Carolina's question, you know, just to be conscious of uh, your role as a leader and, and the fact that being a partner, especially being the, the co-head of the international arbitration practice, the global co-head, just for, to have the conscious of that managing people is part of your job description is already something really important, I would say, because as Carolina mentioned, it's easy for partners to outsource that uh, role to the staff because they are the ones qualified for that, educated for that. And you use the, the, a word which I think it's perfect, meaning, of course, we need staff, but we need, we need them for support because they are the ones educating us on how to behave, for instance, how to manage and how to fulfill a role. But still, the role is ours as partners. It's not theirs. So when you know, associates, uh, this is this go for every company, not only law firms, every single company. Leadership is the ones taking charge, not the only the staff. So uh, you, the way you say it, you know, it's very natural coming out of you of your mouth. But do you believe it's maybe this? It's a different workplace in the US, you know, in your practice in the US and in New York, maybe for partners in New York, this is natural. I wouldn't say it's so natural to understand that you know, part of the job description of being a partner means managing people. Either you like it or not, you have to do it. And, and as you mentioned, even to become a partner, you have to, you know, fulfill skills of, of knowing how to treat people, how to manage people. This is already something really you know, important for our industry, I would say. So do, do you think it's something that is natural for you, Noyana, is natural for you in the US, natural for you in New York? Or you know, do you think there's still room to improve, you know, I, mean, I would say in other areas, other regions? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, the way I see it, and I see it with most of the partners of my generation, at least, is that um, if you want to have a successful practice, the only thing, your capital is your people. So I, I don't see how you can detach yourself from, from managing your team. That, so it comes very natural to me. Maybe it's a generational point, and, I, and I'm not even sure, but maybe in the past, uh, the lawyers, when you were a partner, you were much more in charge of the things that were more important is that you were successful in terms of financial metrics and in terms of, okay, you were the partner, you couldn't be bothered with certain administrative staff. And, and it's not that I love admin staff, but sometimes you have to do it if you, the result that you want is to have a team that really produces the kind of work and in the, work in the kind of way that you need to, to, for you to be successful. I always say, it's like if you're a successful partner, it's not because of you, it's because all the people that you have behind. And, and what you have done is hopefully train those people and give them the platform for them to support you uh, and work around you. But um, maybe it's a generational thing. And, and I think we, now we cannot escape because 
when there is a disconnect between you as a partner and your people in the past maybe associates would have would maybe they took it and that there were no other option today you, they, you you cannot do that they 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 claim they claim your time they claim their attention and rightly so uh, they they feel that they invest a lot and it's true a lot of their lives goes into what we do and we demand a lot of, from them so I think it's fair that they they demand from us. And I had certain experiences when we try to outsource. That is, say, okay, how do we make it more efficient? Because it's also very expensive to have the time of a partner for administrative staff. But that sometimes we have tried to say, okay, we we outsource some feedback or or even for admin for for staff admin staff. So okay, the partners might not give the feedback directly. But for me, I always felt if you have if you don't work with the people, the feedback that you can do, even if you go and you ask everyone and you collect and you provide, doesn't have the same value as the people who really work with you and know you. Um, so as difficult as it is in terms of time demands, I think we we will have to do it. And, and, and I hope in the future, uh, it, this is not even a question that every partner will take care of their, their people a bit more. Good. Now, turning to the financial aspects of our discussion, you mentioned something that, you know, uh, made me think about it as well. Uh, let's talk about well-being in the context of, you know, billable hours, financial targets, workload. You now, billable hours and financial targets, as you know, still play a major role in most law firms' uh, business model, not only in pricing arrangements for the clients, but also internally for bonuses, for evaluating performance, both for partners and associates, career plans, everything. Uh, in short, career progression for both associates and partners still depends a lot on workload and financial results. So how is it possible to reconcile well-being and work-life balance with the current importance that is still given to workload, billable hours, and financial results. And what are the roles? What is the role of leaders in such regard? And you mentioned, uh, Noyana, one additional question. You know, it's it's very expensive for partners to be involved in, um, you know, just communicating with the team, listening to the team, and talking to them, right? And and it's true. And 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 if we treat everything as billable hours you're wasting time spending with the team, right? So in that framework of billable hours, what are you doing? You have to, you're not billing for the client. If we change the framework and understand, you know, this is very, very important, not only for me or for the person, but for this whole structure, you know, that business, that, that initial business model depending heavily on billable hours would somehow be different. Of course, billable hours, hours are important. Of course, financial results are important. No one is saying it's not important. It's only a question of, you know, the weight that you give to them. And if you do it in excess, you are, again, creating financial incentives for the partner not to talk to the team because it is, it is expensive. They should be dealing with the client and billing hours. What, what's your take on this? The, literally the one million question. <laughs> no, I, I think it's it's very challenging. I, I think one of the aspects where we've been try, trying to work more lately in, in freshmen as well. And this is, for me particularly, I, I worked in Europe and in Latin America, and I find it particularly challenging in the US uh, because the way the system has been set up law school is very expensive but that going to law school and to a, a good good and expensive school assures you most of the time a very good job very well paid job but in order for law firms to pay the, the salaries that you need to reimburse your your education loans uh it means that it only works if you work a certain amount of hour number of hours which are crazy so already the system, particularly in the US, I think it's it's very challenging because if we only think, if, if we keep thinking about those metrics that um, law firms need to produce X amount of money because otherwise they cannot even cover their costs and you need to have a 
beautiful offices in the middle of Manhattan because otherwise you don't attract associates and you need to pay the market bonus no matter what, even if you have a good year or a bad year, or even if you put more emphasis in well-being. So insofar as the market pushes everyone to those metrics, I think it's gonna be difficult to change things. And we, what I find in the US, we all follow the market. So we have one or two leaders in the market. So the bonus this year is gonna be this. And then people who have who work at least 2,000 hours, um, they're gonna be remunerated here, there. And there's no flexibility there. And it's also not flexibility because of the cost of education. So it's a more structural problem, but going to things that we can do, and I completely agree with you, um, Rafael, that we have to start changing how much value we put in things. And it doesn't mean that being profitable is not valuable. Like, no, no one can say that. Uh, but how much you value the time that people spend in things that are also valuable for the firm, which is management, your, manage your team, diversity uh, issues. Otherwise, no one would do them. And one thing of, that we are doing now is making sure that time is recorded as non-billable, but valuable non-billable. And we have agreed what, what tasks or, or what areas are really important for the firm, and they count as billable. So you don't feel that, okay, I'm not working for a client today, but I'm I'm just sitting down with people and making sure we we, we are know, interviewing diverse candidates, for example, or, or I go and talk to different universities so that we have access to a more diverse pool of people. If I spend my week doing that, I don't feel that, okay, I'm just giving away and at the end of the year, I'm gonna be punished because of it. And it's the same thing for associates. Um, we, at least in, 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 in my team, I, I require a lot of commitment from from the associates also to business development, but also to training people to go and help me interview new candidates because they are the ones who are gonna work with the new associates. But I have to make sure all that counts also at the end of the year when we look at the billable hours. And for that, for that these new categories, I think, um, help. And then little by little, I think we're gonna be pushed by the associates to change their values. They don't have those values. I, I did this, this um, survey and of course, being paid uh, bonuses or, or a good salary came was important, but came third. So the first thing that people were saying, it was for them, the most important thing is having min minimum work opportunities. So they're interested in, in doing uh, interesting work. Uh, flexibility and remote working is also second. And third is pay and benefits. So already people are telling us, yeah, I want to be paid, of, well paid, of, of course, but maybe I would be willing to take a little bit of a pay cut if I can have, I don't know, more flexible, a more flexible schedule, or if I can spend more time doing other things that I like more. Or um, we see it a little bit more in Europe. In Europe, the whole system is a little bit different. So education is not that expensive. The salaries are not that high. And actually, there's much more emphasis in well-being and the, the hours in general from the law firms, not in every country, but in general, are, are lower. The, the targets are lower. So the, you have to just crack the system a little bit and, and restart from scratch. And um, hopefully with the new generations, it, it's gonna come more naturally than, than with the prior ones. And one more thing, um, and sorry for that. I, I think one important thing, and we've been doing that in Freshness a lot is, if you say that all, the, all of this is important and, and you put it in, it counts as a billable hours, they also have to count for your reviews. So we have now a system that for partners appraisals, financial uh, performance, of course, is always part of the conversation, how, how your practice is doing. But a very important part of the conversation is how are you doing in all these soft skills issues? And people don't advance. It's so important that people might not advance. If you are, you can be a very successful partner in terms of profitability, but if you are not treating your people well, or if you're not cross-selling, if you are not um, being generous with your other partners, that is going to be uh, taken into account and even given a, 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 a big uh, weight. So basically, putting your money where your mouth is, right? So if we're saying that this is important, it has to be important and, and be, be implemented at all levels. And, and we're now doing, which is a lot of work, but we're doing 360 reviews. So the partners are not only reviewed by the 
that the leaders of their practices, but they are being reviewed by, by the associates. So then you just listen what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. This is great, Diana. And even, even those, you know, new policies that you mentioned, even, even for you to take the survey, you know, to, to create a survey for your associate. We do it a lot here as well at AMG to, we have lots of surveys every week uh, to, to try to listen to what the team wants, actually wants instead of what we think they want. So just for you to, to know, to run this survey with, with the team members of, the, of your firm and, and have the results, it's already, I would say, it's already a very important uh, paradigm shift, I would say, because this, this didn't happen at all. You know, it, it wasn't at least, we didn't talk about it so naturally as, as we do it right now. And the importance of the service, because this, you know, sometimes firms create policies, for instance, focusing on the third place that you mentioned, meaning the financial benefits. When people are, are telling us, you now that you have the survey, that they want flexibility, work-life balance, they, have, they want something else first, right? And policies still, are, you know, being drafted and discussed as if financial aspects were the, mo the most important aspects. So it's, again, just a compliment on, on, on your work there. Uh, Carolina, you have something else on, on the financial aspects as well? Well, actually, my question has already been answered. Um, I was going to ask about uh, this issue between paying extra bonuses and, and raising salaries in comparison to what uh, the associates really want. And, and Noyana has already answered that brilliantly. Um, I just wanted to make the comment that um, when, when we were thinking about the question, what we had in mind was that uh, associates in the US, they usually go to a big law firm to get a, well paid to be well paid and they're going to work there for a few years they're going to pay their loans and then they're going to leave and do something else and then now when you're talking that you're changing uh the culture and the environment and so on um maybe since they may like the job and they make like the cases they're going to stay and and you know earn a lot of money work in interesting cases and have the flexibility that they wanted uh, so yes very interesting thank you Nayana. And, and, and on that, I think most of the big law firms or international law, law firms in, in the past had this very strict, very fast uh, track, right? It was one to eight or to seven or whatever. And you either you made, it, you made partner or you left. And I think all that has been changing um, lately. And, 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 it, and it depends on, on teams and depends on firms. But uh, I think there is much more flexibility now to have people stay for longer. I think we all understand that you have invested years of years of training someone and those people uh, have very are performing well and are very valuable. Maybe there are options for them to stay, even though you know that there's no space for everyone to become a partner. Um, this idea of, okay, you will be out. I think we have to also start talking about more, okay, people who are not going to be here forever because they cannot be partner. How do we make sure we ensure that their, their, their next step is a good next step after our law firms can we transition them have them transition to to a client or to do something that they can still use all of the skills that they have learned here and um, move on on to something else that they want to do so i think we're also changing that okay you come year one some of you are going to make partner the other ones are going to leave and that that's very mechanical um which, which is a good thing what you're saying, Oyana, you know, you know, of course, people leave law firms, people leave companies for various reasons, right? Uh, and it's legitimate, of course. They have their own career path. That, that's one thing. A different thing is to have uh, general turnovers. So there is a premise, an implicit premise in what you're saying. Not only your, your last answer, but, you know, I would say all of your answers. You care about people uh for several reasons and also because uh, uh turnovers in general are bad for businesses right especially in our in our industry in, in which we rely so much on on you know on the knowledge that the team acquires about the cases the client that's very valuable for us in our industry right so having a business model in in, in which turnovers you, you assume that they are they're going to occur generally it's bad i mean th this happened in the past right so what you're saying is that 
And this, again, it could be natural to you and also for us, but it's not natural in our industry, as you know. Uh, caring about people and making sure they are respected and well treated and listened to, to make sure, you know, the firm can, to the, possible, to the extent that it is possible, fulfill their expectations as well and their needs, to make sure they are uh, happy doing what they are doing in, the, in that law firm and keeping them there, right? Meaning fighting, you know, this turnover, which is completely like a general turnover, for instance. That that uh, that policy or that posture, it's also something new, I would say. Don't you agree? Yeah, no, it, it, you're right. And I think we are learning that maybe what we were doing in the past is not the right thing. And I one of the pitch lines that I use with with I'm I'm talking to pros, uh, prospect clients is and and I'm just doing not not because I want to sell. It's just because I, I I truly believe it's one of our advantage over some of our competitors is we have a team that have worked together for so many years. And if you look at the more senior people who have been working together for 10, 15, 20 years. That means that all of the knowledge of all of the cases that we have done in the last, I've, I've been with the firm for 20, almost 21 years, like it's all in-house. It hasn't gone away. So you're going to get all this benefit. You're going to get the benefit of people who have been working together for many years. So they get along really, really well. They know how to coordinate. They know how to work together. And I think you cannot underestimate the value of that. And I see it a lot when I go to, to hearings, because that's where you spend more time with your client. So during the the, the case, you might have some meetings and sometimes it's not the whole team. But when you're at a hearing, you have your whole team from the paralegals, the assistants to all of the associates, the partners, and they're all working around the clock and just putting together this performance that we have at, when we do hearings. And the feedback that I always get from the clients is, wow, when you work together, you're like a machine. You get that's always such a pleasure. You you work together so well. You And you, you're working long hours and you're still smiling and you're still having fun and but that you can only create it if you if you do that for several years it's, it's something that you have to to cultivate and 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 it's very valuable at the end but um it doesn't work if your policy is you come in you work well but and then if you want to stay you stay if not you go away and you do two years here and two years there that that doesn't doesn't take you very far well, you know, one last question because our time is almost up. Unfortunately, I could stay here for hours. I'm pretty sure Karina could also stay here for hours. You mentioned before, uh, if I listen to you correctly, you know, the new generation uh, of partners, you know, there's a change in generations and there's also something new happening with the associates, meaning some things that they used to accept in the past, they're not accepting any longer. And, it, that, and this is good news, right? And you mentioned that, you know, that the combination of that, like a new generation of partners and associates speaking up, you know, their needs, expectations, and not accepting everything that the firm has, you know, put in place, that combination is making us change, you know, our place, right, in our industry. And, and you also mentioned the importance of taking ownership and speaking up. Well, once you are you are an associate. So my question to you: How can leaders make it easier for associates to understand that well-being is important? And in terms of self-awareness, how can leaders themselves look after their own well-being because they have you know their own well-being as well? The first question I went to my team, so I put that in the survey, and basically the answer was an obvious answer, but I hadn't thought about that in that way. It's like uh, by example. So you have to show everyone that well-being is important, uh, not only for the team, but also to you. So if if you're telling people, okay, you have to be, we, we, we care about your well-being, but you are working 24 hours and you're sending emails out any time of the day. And I say, don't worry, you don't have to answer, but I, I am the one working weekends. And that is, an again, consistency. It's an inconsistent message that it, they will feel that. so. That's the first thing, and I think it's difficult because what I say, like uh, today as a partner, you have so many demands that I, I'm the first one guilty that sometimes I have to work 
the weekend and say it's not that I'm asking my team to work over the weekend, but if I don't do it in the weekend, I, I don't get to to the Monday with where I want to be or or I'm traveling, so I, I I work hours that are not ideal. Um, but for me, it was okay. It was is that it was a good answer. It just made me think, okay, maybe I I should think about my well being as well. Not only because it's important for me, it's because it's important for the people I work with. Um, the second one is answer that I got is I being honest and transparent and sometimes vulnerable because as partners I think we we tend to say okay we're responsible we have to be the grown-ups in the room and uh if we're doing well or bad it doesn't matter uh and I think people appreciate that sometimes you as a partner also might have a bad day might have had some some problems at home I know your pet might, pet might have uh died and uh it happened to me like uh, not long ago and I had like a, a uh, a dog that a door and I, he passed away and it was a very difficult time for me and at the beginning I was trying to be strong and when nothing happened there and my people in my team that know me but how are you really doing and actually having the opportunity to say you know what actually I cannot even have this call today uh, and you are right I should be taking the day off for that so also as partners being more that the conversation is two ways now they might need things but you also need things so then they feel more more able to discuss with you things without feeling okay, that is going to be a, a a sign of weaknesses and might affect my career. I think that that's that's very important. Um, and then something that everyone says is be positive and bring good vibes. It doesn't matter if you have to provide feedback or if things are not going that well. Always coming from a a positive um, note. I think that also people people appreciate. And and how you to the, your second. Uh, question is how how do you take care of yourself? I think again is 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 work, and sometimes it's easy just to let go and and work late. Just for me, is I I've been trying to do since the pandemic, and um, I started just to support someone that needed some some help to to find a little bit more balance. It's okay, I I will go to yoga to you. I had never done yoga, and I thought I I I always said, and I'm not I don't like that. It's gonna be too quiet. I, I need something with a little bit more. Um, but, but like, okay, I'll go with one member of my team for today. Okay, well, well, let's see. And actually it ended up being so good for me and I've been doing, it saved me during the pandemic and I tried to do it. It doesn't matter how stressful the day is, is or even if it's stressful or particularly if it's stressful, I just try to take, even if it's half an hour and take my time and, and do yoga because I, I know that after that, I will be such a much better person that for everyone who works with me that I, I try to keep it as a, a discipline. Well, you're, you're leading by example, Rina, then I can tell you. Carolina, do you have any other thoughts or final remarks? Because we have to, our time is almost up and we have to finish. Just wanted to say, just wanted to say that it was truly inspiring uh, hearing you. I didn't know um, a lot of things that you said. I, I'm really hopeful now that uh, things are changing. Thank you. This is what I mentioned to you, Nana. You are an inspiration to young, younger generations, for all of us, actually. So thank you very much for, for this conversation. I hope this is only the beginning of more conversations to come. This is an ongoing debate. And thank you again for your time. Thank you, Arbitration Channel, for giving us a platform to do it. It was very... No, thank you. I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Actually, I think it's important to, to discuss all these issues. And most of the things I, I just been thinking about them, but I had never put them together in this structure. So it's helpful as well. And we, we are thank all learning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone in the audience. And hope to see you again soon. Thank you.